Well, good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, we had a couple of trouble with a couple of our microphones over the last week, so just wanted to make sure this uh, is coming through loud and clear. It's good to see everybody this morning. We had uh, 27 at our first uh, service at 8 o'clock, a hymnal service, so um, it appears that we're making good room. Um, so that's why you won't see so many people at this service, because uh, we had a number at the 8 o'clock service. We're also starting our Sunday school today, so at a certain point we'll uh, let the kids and the teachers go, <clears throat> so uh, they can have the, uh, we we'll continue our Sunday school. So whether you're joining us here in person or whether you're uh, joining us online, uh, welcome. Today is All Saints Day, and we are beginning, today is All Saints Day, and we remember all those who have gone before us and all those who are waiting for us in heaven. So, Joel, could you close that outside door? Thank you very much. Um, our service is in the bulletin for today. You should have gotten one email to you. And we'll follow that along. November 22nd is our voters meeting. And I want to thank the people who have already volunteered to serve on the board. Uh, J.J. Scott is going to be our property chairman, and uh, April Stapley has agreed to be our uh, Board of Education. So I want to thank everybody, and uh, we've been uh, approaching some people about uh, serving on our Board of Elders, and they've been agreeing to do that. So November 22nd, these folks will be elected, and uh, we'll also elect our budget. Or we don't elect a budget, do we? No. We'll approve a budget. So... We come today to say thank you to God. We come today to be blessed by him and to give him our thanks and to, be, to receive his blessing and his forgiveness and his encouragement. May God richly bless your time this morning. We'll start with the first song, I Love Your Kingdom, Lord. May God richly bless you today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we're celebrating All Saints Day, on which we give thanks for all the saints who from their labors rest, those who have gone before us in faith. By definition, a saint is anyone looked on as holy by God, and we who have faith in Christ here on earth are already declared by God to be his saints. Indeed, he calls us his children, knowing the eternal end of the story gives us hope in our daily walk through life. This hope is summarized in today's short epistle. <clears throat> the first word of God that comes to us is from 1 John chapter 3, the first verse. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Confident 
of salvation already. Let us confess our sins to our loving Heavenly Father. We confess that we have not lived as your children, Father in heaven. In our thinking, speaking, and acting, we have not demonstrated to the people around us the kind of love you have shown us. Forgive us for these our sins. Open our eyes of faith that we may anticipate seeing you in the eternity that awaits us. Then move us toward purity of living that will give you the glory each day until you return. Beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we are God's children now because of the hope God has poured into us. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his, for his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you agreed to call all people who trust in your Son for salvation your own children. Strengthen our faith so that we pass through each day confident that the hope you have given us shall not fail, and we shall see you face to face in eternity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The second word from God that comes to us today is from Revelation chapter 7, beginning the second verse. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Ishakar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. And then in contrast to this very exact number, it says this. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great trouble. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Now you have a part in this reading. 
Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up to on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of our Lord. At this point, I'd like to dismiss whoever's going to Sunday school, and the rest of us will continue with O Blessed Spring, number 595. May the grace and may the mercy and may the peace of our good God and Savior Jesus be with you now and all the days of your life. You know, if you really want to find out what a church believes, what a preacher believes, what the real theology of that place is, go to a funeral, maybe a few. See, at a funeral, you really find out what the preacher believes, you really find out what a church believes, what their Uh, what their faith is really all about, because a funeral is really about bottom line issues. A funeral is really about life, death, eternity, what, what God is like. All of these things are revealed at the end of life. I mean, when you go to a funeral, how is hope given? What is the basis of confidence? I mean, what does it all mean, life and death? It At a funeral, you don't talk about how to live and what to do and all these different things. It's kind of the bottom line, the important things, the lifetime things. I mean, what is life and death really about? What joy is expressed in Jesus in the midst of sorrow when you lose a loved one? Uh, Are people pointed to the good works that someone did or the good life that they did and hoping that it's enough? Or are they pointed to Jesus and his works? and his perfect life, and his perfect death. How are people comforted? How, are, how is hope given to someone in the midst of a tragic loss? I mean, are they directed to the uh, good works of the person? No, they did their best. I'm sure that's good enough. Or are they directed to the work of Jesus? Go to a funeral. You find out what, what churches really believe and what they really think about. You see, we wrestle with those kind of big questions at funerals. And they're really relevant for us today, too. Today, especially on All Saints Day. 
Because on All Saints Day, we remember all those wonderful Christian friends and teachers and relatives who have taught us, who have been examples to us, who have guided us, and who are no longer with us, whose space is empty and whom we miss. That's what we celebrate on All Saints Day, how we look to them and thank God that they are with him now around the white throne that they have confidence and peace in him. They've left this earthly place of trouble and have gone on to their eternal place where they'll be forever. I mean, this is one of the oldest holidays the church has known, by the way. It, back to the third century is when All Saints Day started being, being uh, uh, celebrated, pretty much about the same time as Christmas, maybe a little earlier. So we've always gotten great hope from knowing where we'll end up. And here today, when we look at 1 John, we really get a lot of good answers to those bottom line issues. Death, salvation, eternal destiny, God. They're important for us right here and right now. See, in this first letter that John gives, he talks about those bottom line issues, especially starting right from the top, where he says... See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. See, one of the bottom lines is that God, his love for us is beyond human imagination. His love for us can't even be understood by those who aren't Christians. I mean, the human way of thinking, the human way of operating is an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You get what you pay for. The punishment should fit the crime. If you did it, you need to pay for it. That's the human way of thinking. Uh, it's how our whole life pretty much functions. It's how everything goes. But God loves his creatures even when they are sinful, even when they're mired in sin. He loves his creatures. He loves his children because he is a loving God. I mean, we know that we are sinful. We try to make up for it. But the more we try to make up for our sins, the more we try to undo what we've done, the more we try to make up for things, we see our imperfections all over again. And we just kind of get into a spiral, a downward spiral, trying to make up for our sins. The more we struggle and depend on ourselves, the more deeply we find ourselves sinking down into sin and imperfection and failure. But Jesus has provided a way out. He's provided love for us. You see, he loves us too much to leave us as we are. So he came into this world and died in your place, and he forgives you all of your sins. And not only that, he adopts you into his family. You don't have to be a foster child anymore. You don't have to wait in the wings. He says, I know you, all your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your guilt, your anxieties, your troubles, your worries. I know the things that scare you. I know the hopes you have. And in spite of all that, I say, yeah, I want you to be in the family. I want you to be with me. I want you to carry my last name so everybody knows you belong with me. He loves us. He adopts us. See what love the Father has for you. Not people like you, but for you. With all of your struggles, with all of your hopes, with all of your failures, with all of your fears, he forgives you and has made you his child. The world doesn't understand that kind of thinking. The world is pretty much, you do for me, I'll do for you, and we'll get along fine. They don't understand this unconditional love. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Yeah, can't understand that. It's just beyond their understanding. It's too much. See, Christians are often called hypocrites. And, and I can see why. We set a great standard for ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God above all things. And then we go out and give abundant, ev abundant evidence of the other thing we believe, that all people are sinners. And we do. We hold up this great standard for ourselves, and then we can't even keep it. Hardly even keep one of the Ten Commandments, no matter how hard we try. And so the world sees us holding up one standard, but not living up to it. I mean, we are all sinners. We get frustrated with our failings and lash out in our anger. We get angry with each other, but since it's not nice to be angry, we, get, we hide it. We get passive-aggressive with each other, which is still aggression. It's just hidden. 
And the cycle goes on. We try to live for God, we fail, we sin. The world sees it and says, how could God love these people? They don't even keep up with what he says to do. But in the face of our failures to live as we should, the world can't understand how God can call us his children because they don't understand God. They don't know God for who he really is. They don't know him as we know him. Loving, forgiving, compassionate, accepting. See, that's the love God has for us. While we were yet sinners, God gave his life for us. Christ died for us. That's what it says in Romans 5. While we were yet sinners, before we had it all figured out, before we had it all cleaned up, before we had it all right, he still loved us and gave his life for us. That's a love that is unconditional, a love the world cannot even begin to understand. The world doesn't know us because the world doesn't know God because the world can't understand him. The bottom line is that God is the one whose love is beyond imagination. It's one of the bedrocks. God is also the one who provides hope, a hope that's sure and certain. That's God. That's the bottom line. He's the one who provides hope that is sure and certain. We usually think of hope, we think it, it's kind of akin to wishful thinking. Yeah, I hope it's going to happen. Uh, many times I've tried to give people comfort and they say, yeah, well, I hope it's all true, Pastor. People look at hope as wishful thinking. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. Gee, I really hope it's true and that it does. When we hope for something, it's more like, yeah, I hope so. But in the Bible, when the Bible talks about hope, it says you can be sure. It's not chasing after some mindless utopian dream that's impossible to attain. It is sure and certain and in something that can be anticipated. When God promises something, you know it's going to happen. You can't anticipate it. Just like Thanksgiving is coming, I'm anticipating that. I know it's going to be here. Christmas is coming. I know it's going to be here. I'm anticipating. I'm looking forward to it. You know, payday is coming. Looking forward to it. Anticipating it. That's the real hope that the Bible talks about. Sometimes we lose sight of God's promises. We forget about it. We get so caught up in our own resources and our own abilities and our own <clears throat> what we can do about a situation that we think it's hopeless. It'll never happen. We might even say some place or someone or something is God forsaken. But there is no place in this entire world and no one in this entire humanity that is actually God forsaken. His love is incomprehensible. His love reaches everywhere and to everyone. His love gives us hope, true hope. And now hope in the Bible is not just the power of positive thinking. Do good things, say good things, and it'll all turn out better. No. Hope is a sure and certain trust in the promise of God. It, it's really a spiritual gift. We only can have this hope because the Holy Spirit lives in us and strengthens us. It's based on something outside of us. When you stand at a funeral grappling with the huge loss, and by the way, when people go to funerals, they're not just dealing with the person who died. When you go to a funeral, you're also dealing with your own death because we all know it'll come. That's why we go to funerals for one. That's why I go to funerals because I won't be there at mine. So I want to hear it now. <laughs> Some people... When you stand in front of that gaping gulf, God is the one who gives us true hope because he calls us his children. Because he not only calls us his children, he's made us his children. Children through the work of Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. I love going to Christian conferences or, um, <clears throat> or study groups or something and someone will ask me, are you related to that guy? And I'll say, only by blood. Only by the blood of Jesus. That's how we're related. Jesus has made us his children and has called us his own. And that's what gives us hope because he doesn't abandon his children. A father always takes care of his kids. That's how we can go to him in hope. We can go to him. Lord, I'm scared. Lord, I'm afraid. Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, I don't know what's coming next. Lord, please help me. Lord, I'm at the end of my rope. Lord, please. And he does. Because a father never forgets his kids. He always takes care of them. Because of his promises, because of his 
life in our life, we have hope past this existence. And so hope in the Bible is not something uh, we wait for. It's something we anticipate. I mean, we wait for it, we anticipate it, we know it's going to come. That's what hope is. Our hope is knowing that we will be like him. Isn't that what it says? Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Now, that does not mean that we will become a God like some religions teach. Uh, it did not become that we will become God, but it means we will be like him. Instead of the fears, instead of the anxieties, the griefs, the regrets, the worries, the depressions, whatever, that'll all be gone. We'll be compassionate. We'll be kind. We will be immortal. We will be perfect. In short, when we get there in his presence, we will be our better selves. That's what he talks about. It's what he shows in the first reading for today from Revelation, where he shows that great white crowd, all the people who have come through the trouble, all those people who have come through the trouble. We will be like him with great joy, with great happiness, with great peace. We will be our better selves. We will be like him. We will have him to enjoy, the one who loves us more than he loves himself, and we'll have each other to enjoy without all of the troubles and the worries and the fears, without all of the sin that corrupts our relationships with each other and causes us sorrow and trouble in this world. See, the bottom line is that God is the one who gives us hope, hope for a better existence in the future, hope for the better that is going to come. And God is the one who purifies us. You see, that's the bottom line. God's love is incomprehensible. God gives us a hope that is sure and certain, and God purifies us for freedom, freedom that's real. And when John pictures this crowd of, of people who have, it says, these are they who have come through the great trouble, meaning this world with all of its sorrows and struggles. They have wa they are purified, they have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. And if you, if you think that's not symbolism, you try washing something in blood and see what color comes out. Sure ain't going to be white. But the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. The blood of Jesus changes us. He is the one who makes us new. That means we're free from sin. Not just the effects of sin, but we are free from sin. It's power. It means we're free to truly do good works. Works motivated by love. Because we are loved. I mean, can you really do a good work without love? To really love our neighbor as ourselves, for example. I mean, if you love because you're afraid of getting punished, that's not real love, is it? If you love because you hope to get something in return, that's not real love, is it? If you love because you're afraid of losing the person or the object of your love and affection, that's not real love, is it? The reason we love is because he loved us first. And love is possible because we've been freed from that tyranny of compulsion. We can love because we want to. We don't love to gain back something. We don't love because we're afraid of losing. You and I have been thoroughly and completely loved by God because he is a loving God. Let that soak in. Nothing we can do can make him love us more. Nothing we can do can make him love us less. He loves us completely and totally just because he is a loving God. He wants us to be our better selves, but he loves us as we are. And because he loves us and we can love other people, we don't have to be afraid of being unloved. We don't have to be afraid of not getting repaid for our love and action because we are truly and thoroughly loved. We are truly free to love our neighbor, to serve him and her no matter what, because he first loved us. We're even free to love ourselves, which sometimes, for some people, can be a real struggle. We're free to love others. We're free to love ourselves because we have been truly and deeply and completely loved by God. So while we have hope for a better future, hope for a better life after this one, when we'll see God face to face, while we're anticipating that, that real hope, we can enjoy the freedom he's given us here and now. We can enjoy the freedom we have to love because we are so completely and thoroughly loved. 
We can enjoy the freedom of a clear conscience. We don't have to worry that we're going to lose something. God has made us his children. God will not abandon us. God takes care of us and provides us all we need. We don't have to worry about guilt. We don't have to worry about shame. We don't have to worry about the anxieties or fears. God has taken all those to the cross. Jesus has scooped them all up, taken them into himself, put them to death on the cross. We serve Jesus because we're free to serve him now, because he has loved us so thoroughly. We can love our neighbor because Jesus first has loved us. The world doesn't understand the great love of God. We've experienced it and continue to grow in that. That love gives us hope, hope for the future that is better, and real freedom, freedom from fear, freedom from guilt, freedom from compulsion, freedom from regret, freedom from all these things. So you see, on this All Saints Day, in this small passage from God's Word, we really do have the answer to all of those bottom line issues about life, about death, seeing God for who he really is, a loving God, a God whose love is incomprehensible to those who don't know him. He is a God who gives us hope, not just that wishful thinking kind of hope, oh, I hope it's going to happen, we'll see. No, a hope that is sure and certain, not some kind of hope in a fantasy, but a hope that can lead to eager expectation because we know who we are. We are his children, we've been loved by him, we've been bought with his blood and made pure. We can be a child just like him. <laughs> you know, sometimes you see people who look just like their parents and they have a saying, you know, you can't deny that one, he looks just like you. That's who God is making us to be, to be his children with his name, so that when people see us, they say, oh, no denying that one. Hmm. He has loved us with a love so deep that he's washed us of our sins, given us freedom to serve him, freedom to love our neighbor, yes, even freedom to love ourselves. Not just some kind of pie-in-the-sky wishful thinking, but it's a solid truth that we can build our hope on build our lives on and have confidence that for those great Christian friends and relatives who have gone before, it's not goodbye, it's I'll see you later. Save me a space next to you. I'll be there soon. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Will you please stand and let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you for giving us another day under your care and grace. And for all of the days between this day and the day we stand before you without any filters or separation, please remind us of your great love. From this day until that day, please work in us to serve our neighbor in love and action. And between this day and that day, keep us always close to you, no matter the struggles, no matter the challenges, no matter the opportunities. Between this day and that day, Lord, we ask that you would guide us and bless us and keep us close to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, we have lost those who are precious and close to us in this past year. Many Christian friends, some in this congregation, who have been great examples to us, who have showed us your love in words and actions, and who continue to bless us by their memories and their examples to guide us. Thank you for all of those who have gone before us, Lord. Thank you for all of those who will be coming behind us. We thank you, Lord, that we have such good company for our journey here in this world. Lord, help us to follow their example, to trust in you, to live in love as best we can, so that when our day comes to face you, we don't face that day by ourselves, but we face it in the loving arms of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, we ask that you would look in mercy upon those who are ill among us, those who have any illness of the body, 
or the mind or the spirit. Grant them healing, give them wholeness. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen their faith, calm their fears, and ease their pains. Especially we ask that you would look in mercy upon Martina Cook and Judy Lochner, Patty Gerber and Vicki Liebert, and Dorothy Nickel, and Bob McKinney. We ask, Lord, that you would heal them, strengthen them, and restore them to health. And let us be the caring Christian family they need in this time of trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. From you comes all authority on heaven and on earth. Thank you for the democracy we live, we live under in this great country. Thank you for the many freedoms that we enjoy here in these United States. Please bless us this week and give us a peaceful election week. Whatever joys or disappointments and fears come this week, Lord, please temper them with knowledge that you are in control, that you are guiding and ruling this world and all of us and leading us to your own good goals. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For these and whatever other good things you would have us ask for, Lord, we ask them all in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Normally at this time we would you may be seated. Normally at this time we are receiving our offerings. But because we're not passing the plate or other things these days, we have a box in the back for your offering. For those of you watching online, please continue to mail in or send in or use the Give Livy app uh, to support our ministry here. Uh, many things are coming back online. God has blessed us richly and continues to bless us, even in this unsettled time. So he is faithful to us, and in response we are faithful to him. So thank you for your offerings and your continued support. We are continuing with the sacrament. And if you're following online, we will be having uh, the drive-up communion in the parking lot at 5 o'clock today, 5 o'clock to 5.30, as we will have every first and third Sunday. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. You have not left us without hope. You have promised a Redeemer who, by his obedient death and victorious resurrection, crushed Satan underfoot and opened to us the door of everlasting life. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation he won for us on the cross. Gathered now at his invitation, we pray that you would give us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, and therefore receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in this sacrament. Strengthen us to live in hope each day until we join saints and angels around your throne in eternity. To you alone, O oh Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. In steadfast hope, we look forward to seeing you face to face with all the hosts of heaven. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now may the God of hope who has filled you with peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah, we, we, we made it work. It, it's just two verses to the one line. So do you want to sing? You want to sing this one? Yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, let's do that one. Let's do that one.
combining our Bible study. Uh, we'll have the live, be a Zoom and live Bible study, so we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall next door. If you're uh, following on Zoom, it'll be pretty much like uh, you're used to. So, as you leave, please, you know, exit from the back, visit outside. Thank you for everything, and uh, go and have a wonderful week, and be a blessing to those you run across.